Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Shattered and welcome to Shattered Reality Podcast. This is Farusha. Uh, and this is our 56th episode. Today is October 3rd, 2017. And um, I'm going to be introducing our guest shortly. But I do have a couple of announcements. The first announcement is, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, my partner in crime here, Miss Kate Valentine, is unable to make today's podcast. This is a first. She's been with us for all the other podcasts, even the live podcast uh, from um, up New York State. She was there, even though it was me speaking primarily. So this is a first for Shattered Reality Podcast, and we shall miss her today, but she will be back in two weeks. Okay. So um, I want to start the show with a, a letter that we received from uh, one of our regular listeners. This listener is so much of a regular listener that he has been listening since before we started. He was listening to the Kate Valentine UFO show. And he always posted under the name of Freeman. And so that's what I'm going to call him now. And I want to just read his letter because I'm very happy to receive this letter from him. It says, Hi, Farusha. Your recent guests have been something of a coup, especially Dr. Roger Nelson and Brenda Dunn. I tried posting a comment related to Dr. Nelson, but it didn't appear. I think I've had problems in the past and posted on the alternate site. Um, episode 55 was very good, too. Um, I know it is UFO related, but Kate mentioned the difficulty in obtaining evidence. She may remember that I was appealing against the Air Combat Command's change in policy that stopped public access to the 84th RADES radar data via FOIA, F-O-I-A. I'm still waiting for an answer, and they quote, misplaced, unquote, my appeal two or three times along the way. However, primary radar data, radar data are available from across the U.S. from the FAA, and Dr. Valley mentioned on another show that satellite imagery can be purchased from specific companies. Efforts are also being made to create monitoring stations with cameras and other sensors, so perhaps the odds are improving that good quality data for an unusual incident will be recorded and available to the public someday soon. Best Freeman. And Freeman is, of course, uh, an expert in things radar, and he is from the United Kingdom, Great Britain, where we have a number of people who listen to our show. Thank goodness. Well, um, so if any of you listeners are having problems uh, posting to our website, uh, please try and get in touch via another means. Uh, for instance, uh, my web's um, my email address, farusha at farusha.com, F-A-H-R-U-S-H-A at farusha.com, same spelling. So um, in any case, we're happy to get letters. We love to get letters from our listeners, but now we are going to proceed with our show. And today I am very, very happy to welcome on to the show um, David Booher, uh, who has written a wonderful book, called No Return. And this is the Jerry Irwin story. And um, we're going to welcome David now. David, are you there? Yes. Hi. Hi, David. Um, so nice to have you on. Your book, I have to say, um, is something of a rarity in a variety of ways for the UFO field. We have had some very excellent uh, UFO-related guests on, like our last guest, Dr. Irina um, and Irina Scott, 
to be clear, Dr. Irina Scott. And she wrote a wonderful UFO book, well, kind of a compendium, a lot of stuff that happened around the, uh, the Ohio area and further out. But l- leaving her aside for a moment, it has been my observation that a lot of books written about UFOs by perfectly good people and kind of people that are regulars in the field, boy, do those boys need an editor. But you're prose was extraordinarily good. So perhaps you would tell us a little bit about your background. I I have a copy of the book, but there's not much of a bio there. Could you give us a, a little bit about your background, David? Well, sure. Um, yeah, there's not much in the bio because I, I honestly couldn't think of uh, much to say. I don't have any uh, any real credentials to write about this subject. It's just something that I got interested in. Uh, And in fact, I didn't even set out to write a book. Uh, I just got interested in this story and decided to start investigating it. And and then as I went along, I realized that there was enough here to make it into a book. You you wrote the story very well. Your your command of the English language, your uh, the way that you went through things in a clear minded way, uh, the verbiage very excellent. But I would say you're all, you also sounded like a forensic investigator, like a. And I know that you're not a policeman. I don't think you are. That you're, I believe, somewhere in the medical field. Is that correct? Well, my background. Um I've done a lot of different things, but um, probably the most consistent thing over the last 20 years is in the field of uh, rehab and injury, injury rehab and sports rehab uh, as a orthopedic massage therapist. Well, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful field, and uh, I'm sure that you're in high demand there. But what, as I say, is quite remarkable, you managed to connect with one of the greats of our um, ufology field, which is uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée. And um, also I saw um, Mark Rodega, who is a familiar name, mentioned in the... Um, in the thank yous at the at the back of the book, but you're kind of an outsider to the UFO field, and I, I think that we people inside the field uh, need more people like you. Okay, that's that's my real really my main observation. Um, a few more things about you that we would like to know and and let our listeners know is, um, have you seen ever a UFO? Where did you get your interest in UFOs? I I guess I don't have. Uh, I've seen some some odd things, but I could. There's nothing I could uh, really say was a UFO for sure. Um, and I guess it's just. Ever since I could remember, I've been fascinated by things of an unexplained, what we call unexplained, uh, you know, UFOs, paranormal stuff. Well, ditto uh, on that, David. Ditto on that. We're, <laughs> that's what we're all about here. But um, you you really rocked this book. You really um, rocked the book. And, of course, I have one thing to say about what you just said, and that is that something that you can't identify in the sky is a UFO. It may not be a visitor from outer space or another dimension, but it sure is a UFO just by way of being unidentified, right? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and it, by that definition, I would say yes. But um, the reason I hesitate is because I'm. It, there could be for the things – that I saw, it's possible that there was a mundane explanation that I just, that I didn't, uh, wasn't able to figure out. Sure. Uh, so I haven't seen anything that, that I would, uh, that I would just tend to think was a, uh, or at least I wouldn't talk about it as something that's a genuine unknown because right. I just don't know enough, you know about what I saw, so. 
Well, I, I understand that for sure. I, I mentioned something on the last show uh, about my being up in uh, Providence, Rhode Island for the Firewater Festival, I think it's called. I might have a word off on that. But um, a couple thousand people up and down the river in Providence, Rhode Island. And, you know, they have a, a fire a fire festival on the water, water fire. And uh, there, it's, it's, it's very nice. And I've been to it a couple of three times. And uh, this time I looked up. And I saw something moving erratically, stopping and starting in the sky. And I pointed it out to some people around me. They were not interested. They thought, oh, it must be, it must be a drone. So I think it's getting harder and harder to identify UFOs. I, I went ahead and took my iPhone out and took a couple of three pictures of it. And, of course, they, the pictures didn't come out. So, um, But, it, you know, there's no I, – I make no um, – claims that it was uh you know uh, what was what am i looking for um, ming from mong uh, let's put it that way or some other extraterrestrial visitor but it's hard to get people even interested in looking up in the sky these days everybody's looking down at their iphones and um other things but what i think we'd like to do right now is maybe you could give us um the general, the basic story behind your book. Now, your book is much more than the basic story. You really go into investigating things. But I think for our listeners, um, who will, uh, many of whom will want to read our uh, your book uh, from our part- podcast, we get uh, I get notes from people. Wow, I, I read that book you t- were speaking about. So people do go out and buy the book. So give us a, a, a general um, short synopsis. Okay. Well, this this was a story that it's it's about an event that occurred in 1959, and the story that was that was published, the full story was published in 1962 by two very uh, well known UFO researchers of that period uh, named Coral and Jim Lorenzen, who were the founders of APRO the Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, um, they were the ones who were investigating this case personally. And they finally published their full story in 1962. Since then, um, it's appeared in, a summary has appeared in two of Jacques Vallée's books, which is where I ran across it. Um, But it's... Since 1962, there has been no additional investigation of this story. And so what I'm about to, this part that I'm going to share right now is what was known from the original investigation before I got started in, in my own investigation. It's about, so the name of this, uh, it, it's about a young soldier whose name is Jerry Irwin was driving back to his base in Texas in uh, late winter of 1959, uh, southern Utah, and he's on a pretty uh, kind of a lonesome, I guess, not very well-traveled highway, at least when he was there. Mm -hmm. He was the only car around. When he's at, at night and he saw this brilliant object coming out of the sky, and it was it, it was definitely strange enough that he pulled his car over to watch, and was out of his vehicle before it went down behind a nearby ridge, where he thought. Hello. Um, although it. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Uh, I think you went out oh. there for a second. So it went down behind a nearby ridge. Could we start up from that point, please? Yes. And at where he where it appeared, where it disappeared, which w- which he thought was very close by, maybe even just a quarter mile, he saw the light flare up and then die down, and and he didn't, but he didn't hear any sound of a crash. Uh, nonetheless. The only, you know, he thought it, it might be a plane crash, 
and that he better take action in case it, it was. So he wrote a note uh, alerting passerby of what was going on and to please notify police. And then he wrote stop in large letters on the side of his car with shoe polish to get people to pull over and read his note that wow. was attached to his steering wheel. And at that point, he set off into the snow going uphill to where he thought the, the thing had crashed. And then, but shortly after he started walking, he blacked out. Wow. The next thing he knew, he wake up in a hospital and it was 24 hours later and he had no idea what happened in between. Amazing. Um, he's, uh, the doctor was in the room as he was waking up and then shortly the, the sheriff came in to hear his story because they were very worried when they, when he talked about a possible plane crash and they were unable to find a crash. So they wanted to get his story, but all he could tell them was basically that he stopped and he went looking for this thing, this, this bright object that, that went behind the ridge. <clears throat> well, then they, they tell him what happened to him. <clears throat> they found him uh, apparently about a quarter mile from the road, face down in the snow. Uh, they couldn't find any sign of injury, but they just couldn't wake him up. And his uh, vital signs were normal. Um, and they said, but the one thing that was very strange was that while he was still unconscious, he was muttering the words, jacket on bush. Mm. And he said, well, I don't know. I don't know why I said that, but now that you bring that up, um, I was wearing a new sports jacket under my army overcoat when I, when I was setting out to look for this thing. And where is it by the way? And they said, well, we didn't see a jacket. You weren't wearing any, anything like that when we found you. And the search party didn't see a jacket laying around. So that was, that was an interesting kind of puzzle, mm -hmm. but it didn't, the, the full significance of that didn't really uh, come to bear until later. Um, after a few days in the hospital, they um, sent him back to his army base. They couldn't find anything wrong with him. So then the, then the army checked him over. They couldn't find anything wrong with him either. So they sent him back to duty. And this is again, in, uh, this is at Fort Bliss, Texas, where he, he was serving okay. as a Nike missile technician. That's, so they, a, that's a very interesting um, job. Uh, the Nike missile technician. I just put that in there for our listeners because we have had a number of people on who have talked about, uh, particularly Robert Hastings, the relationship between UFOs and some of these missiles and the missiles turning off. So I just, that's my insert. Go ahead, David. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it was a uh... That was kind of the state of the art, uh, anti-aircraft, anti, I mean, it was really designed as a last ditch effort. Uh, I mean, it was our, the last link in our chain of protection at that time against, uh, a Russian bombing attack basically. So if they got through all the way and penetrated U S airspace, uh, these missiles were designed to take down those, aircraft before they could drop their payload. And that was before they had the uh, ICBMs. Right. So it was a pretty important, uh, they were strategically very important. Anyway, um, so then, even though Jerry was released back to duty and he was supposedly 
okay as far as they could tell. He kept having problems with uh, blackouts and amnesia. And about three weeks after the original incident in Utah, he passed out in downtown El Paso, uh, which is adjacent to Fort Bliss. And they took him to El Paso General Hospital, and he was out for a few hours. When he woke up, his first words were, were there any survivors? And that's exactly what he said the first time he woke up in Utah. He wow. was, he, in his mind, he was right back on that night. And it was as if uh, nothing had happened in between. He couldn't remember anything. And they, uh, they tried to kind of jog his memory. Uh, but he, it took him a while. They, they had to take him back to the Army hospital. And he didn't recognize anybody at the Army hospital, even though he'd been in the ward only three weeks earlier. Hmm. Um, so this time they kept him... It was the they kept him in the psych ward for 32 days this time because they really wanted to observe him for a sustained period. And during that time, they gave him a sodium amytal interview, which is like a, they call it truth serum. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially it's a way of inducing a hypnotic trance. Uh, so under, under the influence of sodium amytal, they questioned him to try to penetrate his amnesia. Um, and then when, he, when they brought him out of the trance, uh, they wouldn't tell him anything about what he had said, and he had no memory. And they, they basically just told him it didn't work. So he never found out. Hmm. Now, the day... As he remembered it, this was the day before they released him from the hospital. The next day when they released him, he went into a trance. Uh, and in that trance-like state, he left the base. He boarded a Greyhound bus. Uh, essentially, he was going AWOL. And he took an overnight bus to Utah. He didn't even really know what he was doing. Um, the next day, he got off the bus at Cedar City, which was the city he was taken to after his original incident. And then he just walked out of town for about six miles up into the canyon and he uh, walked off the highway straight back into the bush for some distance where he found his jacket hanging on a bush, his missing jacket. There was a pencil with a note wrapped, wrapped around it that was stuck through a buttonhole of the jacket. He pulled out the pencil, un unrolled the note, and then burned it without reading it. And at that point, he woke up from his trance. Wow. He was very disoriented at that point when he woke up from his trance. And suddenly, he didn't really know where he was exactly. He had a vague idea. He knew he was AWOL. So it took him a while to find the highway again. When he got to the highway, he found his way back to the to Cedar City and turned himself into the police. And then uh, he was able to talk to the sheriff, who no, he no longer recognized, Amazing. even though he'd, he'd seen the sheriff only three weeks earlier. Um, the sheriff then uh, contacted his army base, and a few days later, they picked him up and took him back to Fort Bliss. Well, he had more problems after that that culminated in 
another lengthy stay in the uh, psych ward. And when they when he came out of the psych ward uh, at the end of July, the very next day, he deserted his post, and he was never seen again. And that's that's the last anybody heard of him. So that's the the basis of the initial story that was recorded by the Lorenzans of APRO. Yes. And um, I, I would say that I believe, uh, and I could be wrong, it could be a similar story, but that um, I had heard, I'm going to say two or three years ago, on another show, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, talk about this story and say that he had disappeared permanently to her knowledge and, and to everybody else's knowledge uh, in the UFO world. At any rate, that would be the case. Right, David? Right. Nobody ever heard from him again. And what, what kind of, I, okay, and that's the point where I got interested. I had read this story uh, even a couple of decades before uh, I started investigating but I just happened to kind of, I always remembered it, but it was just one of so many fascinating stories out there. But the second time, or it was, I'm sure it was more than the second time that I stumbled upon it recently, which was, I guess, 2013. Mm-hmm. I don't know why it happened that way, but for some reason, when I read that story again this time, uh, it just wouldn't let me rest. You were almost compelled. Like Jerry was compelled to go after his jacket, you were compelled to go after Jerry. Yeah, and I don't have an explanation for that. I mean, all I can say is, and it's, it was a unique experience in my lifetime. Um, I, for some reason, I just, I just uh, knew that I had to uh, investigate this story. And the interesting thing to me about that, and, and I had a sense of urgency about it too. Interesting. Um, and I, I just wonder because about four months after, okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. Sure. Uh, to make a long story short, I found this man, Jerry Irwin. And we conducted a, uh, a series of interviews. I went to his uh, home in Idaho uh, twice in 2014. Uh, the second time was in September, and four months later, approximately, he suffered a massive and very nearly fatal heart attack. Oh. And, I mean, it was so serious, his heart was stopped for over half an hour. Oh, boy. We could have a whole program on whether he had a near-death experience, but we won't go there right now. Go ahead. Go ahead, David. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and at that point, his, his when I was interviewing him, and this is also a large part of the story, I, I was able to understand pretty quickly that he had some major gaps in his memory about the events of that year. Mm -hmm. um, and w after his heart attack, his memory took another major hit. Oh, boy. And, and he, he lost a lot of what was left at that point of his memory. So I guess what I'm saying is um, I don't think this really could have happened, this, this project, if I had waited or if anybody, if nobody had gotten involved uh, at the, in that time frame before that massive heart attack, I just doubt this ever would have happened. Well, I can't help but think um, from an intuitive point of view that somehow you were called upon, because here you are, you're a guy interested in the paranormal in general, never had an up-close UFO sighting, um, not a not a mainstream ufologist, good writer, great guy, 
but uh, just suddenly takes off on this adventure to go see Jerry Irwin, and you manage to meet up with him and get as much of his story as he remembered, but what is quite baffling is all the things he didn't remember. And I will, uh, you know, fill something in here, and that is that for those people who might be listening who uh, think, that, you know, they're on the fence about what UFOs are or if there, they even exist. To the people who wonder if UFOs even exist, um, I would say that David, our author here, has gone to great lengths within the book to look at the idea of, uh, was this a hoax? Did Jerry hoax it? Um, it did, did the government uh, orchestrate uh, a PSYOP attack? And um, I'm forced to conclude from your research and my own thoughts that indeed it was not, that he did see something and that it was genuine to a point of when he got in the hands of the army. And then, you know, it's, it's anybody's guess exactly what they did to his mind. I would not be able to comment uh, intellectually on that part. I, um, I, I, one thing that's probably really important to to observe is that, um, and when Jerry was asked about his experiences in 1959 by the Lorenzans, right, he felt clear that whatever his problems were, they were coming from his experience in Utah. This is what he also told, and, and this. We, we actually received a, a lot of new information uh, that was made possible by Jerry authorizing the release of his medical records and service records from the Army, mm-hmm. which he had never seen, um, which, in which he also told his doctors the same thing. He, at least in his mind, there was no question that the continue, continued problems he had with his blackouts and his amnesia stemmed from his experience in Utah. Now, that's also backed up by the records because his doctors looked into his background. They could find no history of anything similar for him. Mm-hmm. And he had been in the service previously in the Air Force for four years. They and he had been in the army for I think this uh, for a little over a year when this happened. Mm-hmm. He had no he had he'd had no disciplinary problems. He'd had no medical problems. He'd had no psychiatric problems. But suddenly he has this experience in Utah, and his life is is upended. It's everything's upside down suddenly. He's okay. going in a, into a downward spiral. He's having a as a result, he's having what are interpreted as disciplinary problems, but they're really, he's just suffering, basically. Problems, uh, uh, mental problems, really. I mean, in a he in the view of the army of anybody who, uh, at that time, we can say that UFOs were not unknown, but abductions in 1959 were extraordinarily rare, and there was no... Um, like template of of what an abduction experience should be like. Now, I want to mention here two things that came came to me in the book that I thought were great, but I want to do one thing for you first. I want to slate that um, we're speaking to David Buher, who has written a book called No Return, The Jerry Irwin Story, UFO Abduction or Covert Operation and it's published by our friends at Anomalous Books. Okay, so two things that uh, seem to me to be marvelous that you uh, managed to uh, get. Uh, First, the Army records with the doctor's note about what uh, uh, Dr. Valentine, I believe it was, he wrote down about uh, what came out, something about what came out under the sodium uh, sodium, sodium amatol. I always think of pentatol, but it's amatol in this case, uh, treatment. And then the fact 
also that you were able to access the APRO stuff. Now, I know, of, I've heard a lot about, and I know of a lot of people who have petitioned the folks who are now in possession of the APRO information since Coral and Jim Lorenzo sadly passed away um, and have been totally unable to obtain any information from the people who, who I have no idea who they are. I'm just saying this because I've heard this. They uh, have not been able to get the information out of APRO. How did you manage that? Well, all I could say is um, I just... I just decided to to ask, and they complied. And I, I, you know, it, which was a huge benefit to my research. Indeed, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it 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 really filled in some important pieces of information um, in terms of things that the Lorenzans had uh, had found, but. For whatever reason, it didn't make it into their final story, and I think part of that is simply because they didn't—they didn't have enough information to know what was going to be significant ultimately about certain details. Um, so, I—that's I, all I can tell you. I mean, in this case, I—they decided to help me out and provided those files, which... Well, you've got the gold in touch with this, uh, David, and I intuitively, I just feel like it, it, there is some kind of uh, faded situation here, whether um, uh, some unknown force um, has uh, guided you through this. Um, certainly, uh, the, the, the name of Jacques Vallée has... Uh, no doubt helped you in your research, and but you've done a marvelous job all on your own there. And uh, the, the, can you perhaps talk a little bit about the sodium pentothal, uh, the sodium amatol uh, part there? What actually was found out that Jerry had said, or at least what did Dr. Valentine write there? Yeah. Um, now, to preface this briefly. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, there had simply been no stories of abduction in the media at this point when this happened. Uh, of course, there was kind of a UFO mania in the 50s, and there was this kind of contactee mania, uh, which was a very different kind of phenomenon. Um, but this is what one thing that makes this story so fascinating is it, it bears the hallmarks of a classic UFO abduction case. But there, at that point in time, he had, if he was inclined to make it up, or if he was someone who was susceptible to the power of suggestion, let's say, there, there simply weren't any stories to influence him in that regard. So this is still two years before the Betty and Barney Hill case. And their story didn't even reach the mainstream media until the mid-60s. So this was considerably earlier on. Okay, and now that's important in regard to Jerry's doctor, because Jerry's doctor certainly couldn't have heard any of these details before from other cases. And there's no doubt from reading his notes that to him, this is just total nonsense, what Jerry, what he hears Jerry saying. Um, and he's inclined to think that it's a, uh, this is a symptom of psychosis. And yet, uh, I'll just, I'll read briefly the, what he wrote in his notes here. Um Okay, uh, he's Jerry stated. Uh, he's speaking about Jerry. Okay, stated okay. that there was a special intelligence that he couldn't explain to me, since it would be incomprehensible to me, which has directed him not to remember or not to tell me about any of the events in Utah. He says that if he tells 
what was behind the incidents in Utah, there will be a big investigation that he does not want to be bothered with, and also because it will harm many people and he doesn't want that to happen. He states it all began at the age of three years, Uh although he will not reveal how or what began, stating it would provide a clue to me as to what is behind all this. He also, he informed me that he could leave this hospital anytime if he wanted to by invoking a special force. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, that, that is, I, I read that um, in your book and that's quite mind blowing. And that kind of uh, seals the whole thing in, in my mind um, to some extent to, that this doctor prior to the abduction phenomena, uh, put this gentleman under sodium amytal and came and, and Jerry came out with basically that. And, and really, we have no reason to believe that the doctor was lying in his notes. Um, uh, it, you did bring up the idea that he may have been given the sodium amytal more than once, and this could, in fact, have... Uh, made his memory even worse than it was to start off with. But clearly, he was having a lot of amnesia before he ever got the sodium amytal. Yes, that's true. Um, and one one more point about that interview is, uh, there's a great deal of concern that's been voiced over the last, you know, two or three decades about... Uh, unscrupulous or inexperienced uh, hypnotists um, consciously or unconsciously leading their uh, subjects to remember things that that didn't actually happen. Right. I mean, there's a word for it, but I can't think of that right now. But absolutely, this could not have happened in this case, which which is one more um, one more aspect that makes it seem it uh, adds to the authenticity, I think. Indeed, um, indeed. And I'm I'm compelled by the mention of him being three years old, um, you know, because being an experiencer myself, uh, I remember feeling like something was pulling me out of my body when I was in that age range. So I have a lot of sympathy for for Jerry there. And may I ask you his condition currently as we speak in 2017? He's still with us, I believe. As far as I know, he is. I I mean to uh, try to get in touch with him sometime soon. I did talk to him in June, and he's had a, a slow, long, slow recovery because that heart attack was, uh, I guess that was a little over two and a half years ago. Mm-hmm. And his apparently his memory and his um, functioning have been slowly improving over that time to the point where this time he remembered me and he hadn't before that. So um, he so I'm I'm hopeful that he'll continue to improve. And, and he was very optimistic as well. I hope you'll have a reunion with him. That would be nice. Um, I wonder if this fame has reached him of, you you know, the fame that your book perhaps has given him and the fact that people in ufology thought he was dead. But you really brought out so many fascinating. uh, You compared his case with the Hills, the Betty and Barney Hills case. And you also revealed that even Carl Jung had an opinion on the matter, and that Coral Lorenzen uh, stood firm with her opinion. Now, I, you know, I have no doubt that Jerry, in my mind anyway, that Jerry w- was the victim of some very strange event. I don't believe that the event itself, from what I've read from you, this I'm just giving you my opinion, you know, kind of going in here with you. I don't believe from what you wrote and from everything that you said, and you seem like a very incredibly honest uh, researcher giving all sides of the story. I, I don't believe that the actual event was orchestrated by the government. It, it seems like a, a whole lot of money to be spent for 
one little soldier who, you know, would end up with mental problems. Um, although it was the time, as you mentioned, of um, psyops and uh, and the um, uh, all of a sudden my mind went blank on the big program of psyops that that took place at that time. You know that you know it, David. Uh, what was the MK MK Ultra? Yeah. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you. Um, but there's one thing that I don't believe you covered in the book, okay? And I, I'm, I don't know that this was anything about the case. And in fact, what I'm going to say um, is also still a very big mystery, even to astronomers. Now, if I remember correctly, his initial sighting was in February. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, his initial sighting was in February, and for the last 20 years or so, um, he, we here on Earth, now this is after Jerry Irwin's event, because we're talking about the last 20, 30 years, we have experienced here on Earth something called the February fireballs. Are you aware of that? Hmm, no, I guess that's new to me. Okay. So let me let me say a few words about that and um uh it's an it's an astronomical anomaly uh it's not thought to be uh extraterrestrial intelligences but no one really knows but for i'll say about the last 25 years and i'm not an astronomer so i could be wrong on my facts there have been what appears to be very large meteors coming into the atmosphere in the uh, northern hemisphere and crossing the sky uh, sort of obliquely. In other words, when you see a shooting star, mostly they come right down and they're gone in a second. These February fireballs um, seem to be molten metal and they cross the sky at a slower rate that uh, astronomers are uh, have theories about why they are traveling so slowly. I was very uh, lucky to see uh, uh, two of these things, and some astronomers have never seen them. So the fact that I saw two of them is like kind of wow, um, both in the same year. Uh, the first one I saw in the beginning of March, and um, it's it streaked across the sky as I was walking out at night. Uh, around a small lake in New Jersey. And it crossed the sky slowly, and I saw it about when it was overhead, and then I saw it go down, and it appeared to go down behind this hill. And I was tempted to go chase it, because <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, I'm going to find this big meteor uh, virtually blocks away from where I am. And um, uh, the color, it, it kind of, what it looked like, it, it sort of had a greenish color, which may have indicated that there was copper in it, but, uh, you know, I'm not a chemist. Greenish and then some little bit of bluish. Uh, there may have been like a little bit of a crackling sound, but the sound was not extraordinary or even noticeable probably to some people. I was with another person, and I was literally speechless. I was pointing to the object as it went down, and the person that was with me was looking at me like I'd lost my only brain. And uh, <laughs> she refused to look in the direction I was pointing with my mouth open going, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> and, um, oh. and so I went home, and I researched it a little bit, I called up a local MUFON person who I know who's been on the show, and um, he said he thought it was a meteor, and he directed me to the meteor sighting. There's a whole uh, compendium a list online of all the meteors that are of any size that might come down to Earth or go past. Now, um, this one was seen oddly enough, all the way from Scandinavia 
all the way to, I'm going to say West Virginia, somewhere in that region. So it crossed the Northern Atlantic from Sweden, let's say, Norway, all the way across uh, somewhere in Canada, maybe uh, Prince Edward Island, like that. People saw it, and people saw it all the way down Virginia and West Virginia. It made an arc. But it looked very much like it was going to crash in my vicinity. And were I younger and abler, and I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, ancient, but I wasn't about to take off um, over the hill uh, looking for it. But I would have liked to, but I would have been, I wouldn't have found anything. Um, That being said, uh, because I saw the first one, uh, I was riding in a car and I saw a second one, which I then confirmed with... um, that uh, meteor site, but the second one was not at all anywhere near as uh, dramatic as the first one. The object was uh, more than half the size of the moon, I would say, and um, just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. Now, I did a blog spot about that, and um, what uh, I did get a response to that blog spot from an astrophotographer in Europe, and said that I was very blessed to have heard from it, I, I have, to have seen it, rather. Uh, I don't know if that was his exact words, but he felt that there were some extraterrestrial intelligences operating there. Um, and uh, but far be it from me to disagree, because I have been an experiencer, but uh, it, was, it was a monumental experience in my life, is all I can tell you. It's, it was like... I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. It looked almost like a comet, but a moving comet, you know, where a comet is bigger than a, uh, a meteorite. Um, but I, I would just suggest that you look at that. Um, but that does not preclude in any way the idea of alien intelligence or the fact that it could be uh, even uh, some kind, if it were that, it could be some form of oblique message from um, an alien intelligence. Um, but I do suggest you take a look at the uh, the February fireballs. Yeah, that's very, it's very intriguing. Um, and I could see why if, if somebody saw something like that, just like the way you were affected, why that could be compelling enough to cause someone to go on and investigate. Absolutely. As, um, and if that happened, uh, one, one thing that uh, seems to be a key to the whole story of Jerry Irwin seems to revolve around that jacket. And uh, one odd detail about the jacket is that he uh, uh, supposedly he lost his jacket somewhere near Highway 20 because that's where he had his original incident. That's about, uh, oh, about 30 miles, 35 miles from Cedar City, north of Cedar City. And then I found a, a really interesting puzzle when I started looking at the original stories that were published in newspapers and comparing them to what the Lorenzans published. Um, according to the Lorenzans, when Jerry returned to Utah in a state of trance in March, I guess that was April. In April, he walked out of Cedar City along Highway 14, and the place where he actually found his jacket was uh, a good 50 miles by road, or I think it was approximately 30 miles as the crow flies, from the site of his original incident. Wow. And that's a very interesting puzzle. Um, that So it, it's certainly possible that there's a, a lot of explanations for what he might have seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it, where it gets more interesting is why did he, why was he unconscious for 24 hours and also What's the story with that jacket? <laughs> yeah, really. And him him uh, burning the note that he'd written on the jacket without reading it? 
But yeah, uh, that's pretty bizarre. He he actually, when I talked to him, and also when he talked to the Lorenzans, he remembered passing out not long after he left his vehicle. But interestingly, the sheriff's own report, which was which was something I was able to get a copy of a, a letter that he wrote about Jerry's encounter or his incident um, fairly late in my research. But in that letter, the sheriff said that they found him at the top of the ridge, not right close to his car, and that uh, Jerry at that time, because the sheriff was the first one to hear any testimony from Jerry, Apparently, Jerry told him that he remembered walking up towards the place where he thought it crashed, and with every step, he saw that light getting brighter as if he was approaching a, a glowing object. So in, the, in this first telling of the story, Jerry uh, was telling a story that seemed to indicate that it was something that was there and he was getting closer to it. And right when he should have seen it, clearing the ridge top, is when he blacked out. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I wonder if we will ever find out. Um, I know that Jerry doesn't seem that interested in finding out what happened, so he probably wouldn't even take um, a hypnotic um regression at this point, and I don't know if he should, but it, it will remain a great mystery. And perhaps you would like to tell the name of your book again and, um, and, the, um, and you know, where people can get it and how they can. Okay. Yeah, it's called No Return, The Jerry Irwin Story. Uh, the subtitle is UFO Abduction or Covert Operation. It's available on all the major book outlets like Amazon, Barnes and Noble, the, and the, in an e-book, uh, sorry, in ebook form as Kobo and those other f- formats. Um, and I have a Facebook page set up for it. At uh, it's called No Return at Forgotten Encounter. I just liked the Facebook page today, and we hope you will like our Facebook uh, page of Shattered Reality Podcast. And we've certainly really enjoyed having you on. And um, I just threw that thing out there about the February fireball because I had the experience with it. And in fact, scientists don't know quite what they are anyway. So it, it could fit into the mystery or perhaps it doesn't fit in at all, but we'll just put it out there. And again, we thank you so much, David, for being a guest on Shattered Reality Podcast. Oh, thanks so much for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Oh, we did. Well, I did too. And uh, and um, <laughs> we are not here today, except uh, I think that our engineer, Bill, has enjoyed it as well. Yeah. And uh, and Kate will be back, and I'm sure she'll listen to it as soon as we get the, uh, the audio up and running. Okay, um, David, I hope to speak to you again. Oh, one question before you go. Do you have any future plans for investigating any other interesting anomalous stuff I, not at the moment but you never know what might be around the corner well i certainly hope you do because i personally enjoyed your writing style and you could give some of the the people who write ufo books a few english lessons that they could well need well I, thanks very much for your kind words <laughs> <laughs> the kind to you, not so kind to some others, and I'll probably get flack from that, but hey, that's what I'm here for, get some flack. Okay, uh, David, bye now. All right, take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so here we are, um, uh, still with Shattered Reality on October 3rd, 2017, and from our listener's corner, I would like to present... Um, Oddly enough, and it's really it's really more the 
rule than the exception, we have an artist today. Uh, last uh, last show, we also had an artist with it in the experiencer corner. And so uh, it's it seems to be well known that creative people, people with open minds, the creative type of person, is much more likely to have an experience, uh, particularly a UFO experience. It seems that the two major areas of people who have the UFO experience are either creative people, like our next guest, and also uh, military men who are perhaps in planes or watching the skies. They also are very high uh, in the ranks of people who see UFOs. So let me now introduce um, artist and um, intuitive June Ponte. Hello, June. Hi, Farusha. How are you? I'm doing pretty well today, and uh, hopefully you are too, because we would like to hear um, the full story of your... You have had two UFO experiences, one a little bit more significant than the other, but both quite amazing. So uh, would you like to take us back to the... Tell us the approximate year and uh, what you were doing during that day, and then take us into the encounter. Okay. Well, it was the spring of 1979, and at that time I was an anti-nuclear activist. And I'd spent the day demonstrating, and uh, we were blocking the entrance to the corporate offices of Jersey Central Power and Light Company. And they were in Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. So it was no business as usual. Um, because they were the owners of the Three Mile Island nuclear facility. And that had, as you may remember, a dangerous nuclear accident. Very dangerous. Yes. Um, actually, the worst in U.S. history. Anyway, I was arrested with a few others, and we spent the rest of the day in jail in Mountain Lakes. Eventually, my sister came and bailed me out. Um, we went to her house in West Milford to calm down and have some pizza. So uh, I still had to get back to my home in Union City, so my friend Frank arrived late in the evening to drive me home. Um, he had this old Army Green Plymouth Valiant and that he called Miss Turanium. And um, <laughs> <laughs> it was a cool car, but it didn't go very fast. We left for home around midnight, and we were driving down Route 23 in West Milford. And it was very dark. Uh, I don't think there were any lights on that road at that time. Uh, Frank was focused on the road, and he was chatting away, as he liked to do, and I was gazing out my passenger side window. Suddenly, I see this enormous UFO. It was, it was so big that just the size was shocking. And, uh, you know, people say bigger than a football field. How big was it? <laughs> How big was it? It was bigger than a football field. It was bigger than anything I've ever seen. I, I don't know. It just it just went on forever. And the the weird thing, Krisha, it wasn't in the sky. It was on my side of the road, only feet away from where the road ends and the grass starts on the side of the road. And uh -huh. um, it was a one you know uh, one lane going in my direction, Route 23 at that top at that point in on Route 23. And uh, this thing was hovering uh, soundlessly about 50 feet over this valley-like depression in the ground. And it had uh, red, yellow, and green lights going around the rim. And it was shaped like a classic round flying saucer. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, it looked like something off a comic book. It was, it was so, so like what you would imagine. Uh, in those days, we called them flying saucers, really. And it was... So... so, so Junie, mm -hmm. we would say circular and um, uh, circular shape, uh, larger than a football field. Oh, yeah. Um, with a cupola on the top or a flat on the top? And it had what I thought of as a dome, I guess, a cupola. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. And uh, Okay, same difference. Yeah. So it, 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 I think it was so shocking that my mind, uh, I, was, I was trying to take it in. And then all of a sudden, I heard this voice in my head that wasn't my own voice. We all have our own voice in our head, right? 
But yes, yes. I was hearing another voice, and it kept saying in a kind of mechanical way, it's a radio tower that fell down. It's a radio tower that fell down. And I kept tilting my head. Every time it said it, it was almost like automatic. I would tilt my head and try to see that those lights around the rim as a radio tower that fell down. And, but, but my own voice in my head was saying the other voice, no, it's not. It's not a radio tower that fell down. It's a flying saucer. So uh, it, it was, a, yeah, it was a very weird moment because I guess my mind was processing it. And I don't understand if it was, you know, how that, that voice came in my head. I don't know if it was then. It, it was another part of me. But whatever it was, it was pretty, pretty freaky in my head as well as what I was seeing. Anyway, I wanted to see if my friend saw the same thing I saw, but I didn't want to suggest to him what I saw because I really wanted to know if he saw anything. So I said, Frank, um, look to your right. Do you see anything? And he looks over and he says, holy crap, it's a flying saucer. We're, we're getting the hell out of here. So Frank slams his foot on the gas, but all this geranium didn't go much over 45. So that didn't do, <laughs> it didn't do much good. And I was in a panic because this thing just kept coming. You know, I'm looking out the window and we, we just keep driving past it. It was like a bad dream. You just kept going past it and past it. But finally, um, it seems to take forever to get past this thing. But we got past it. I don't remember. Uh, we didn't know about this in time in those days, or certainly I, I did never heard of that. Uh, so I don't know what happened. I don't remember what time I got home or if anything weird happened. But um, it's been almost 40 years since that time. And Frank and I still... Indeed. Yeah, we still talk about it. Every time I see my buddy Frank, um, Mr. Geranium's gone, but our friendship is strong, and uh, we still talk about it. It was uh, a very, very shocking event since this was something quite near the ground and quite near us. I could have walked over to it and touched it. Uh, or if That's I could, frightening, If I could June. jump up That's... high enough. But, you know, since it was in the depression in the ground, you know, it was, it was just right there. It was just right there. And yes, it was very frightening, Farisha. Very uh, shocking. And um, but I had always wished, you, ha- you know, I would see one. But I thought I'd see like a nice, pleasant little lights in the sky. But not so much, you know. Yeah. Well, did you have? Do you recall having any dreams regarding this? I don't think so. The only thing I can recall was I've, you know. I have always been frightened of the dark, but I attribute that more to my intuitive side, mediumistic experiences, and I have seen people in spirit form. And so, uh, you know, a night without the lights on, you know, I didn't have too many of those uh, for many, many years. But what I oh yeah, you wear secret sisters under the skin. I think. <laughs> I think so. I think so. Um, one of the things I remember is when Whitley Strieber's uh, Communion came out, that book scared, scared me to death, it scared me to death, and it set me back, way back to like the terror I felt from this experience. And uh, I, I understand yeah. entirely because the John Mack book, uh, uh, the, the, the fellow who uh, investigated um, people who... Uh, were uh, abductees when I I could not read that book I I picked it up out of the library and I would read like three pages and I couldn't sleep all night it was that affecting to me when I read the the John Mack uh, book about abduction phenomena um so you did have a a a second uh, UFO sighting that was a little less dramatic but nonetheless real uh, do you want to just tell us about that? And we so much appreciate you being willing to speak with us here on Shattered Reality in the Listener's Corner. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to, Farusha, because a lot of people don't feel comfortable to talk about these things. But uh, I know that um, you, like me, uh, we've, we've seen these things. We know they exist. And I, what I think is that people who have seen and know that, that there are beings on other planets, that there are UFOs visiting us or living here, we seem to attract to each other. I can't tell you how many people I've met 
that have seen something. I, I know people that have had uh, even scarier experiences than this one. And uh, I think it's very interesting. I think we do attract to each other, and I'm not sure why. But um, the other... It- well, send them on over to Shattered Reality. <laughs> I will. Some of them are not supposed to talk about their experiences. You know what about that type. But um, what would I want to tell you? Oh, yes. So the other one, uh, I had uh, uh, an experience. I was quite young in Union City. And that one was a, um, I was walking home from the grocery store. I was a little kid, 11, 12, maybe. And I looked up and there was a cigar-shaped object in the sky and the weird thing was that you know we used to have a lot of blimps back in the uh, late 50s you know floating yeah. around uh, going over to new york i guess the goodyear blimp others and i always found this uh-huh. kind of creepy but this was not a blimp it was very elongated and kind of i can't explain it it looked like an elongated tablet or a cigar or something of mm-hmm. that shape and um It kind of tilted every uh, occasionally. It was very creepy. It almost looked like something that could fall. And it was very silent. And I remember it was a gray day. It was cloudy. But yet I could see this thing. It looked like a silvery gray metallic thing. And um, as a kid at that age, I just thought, oh, that's neat. Looks like a cigar. (laughs) But it it didn't scare me, I guess, because it wasn't close. You know, and actually, the blimp scared me more than that thing. I think because the blimps look like bombs to me. This thing just looked like a cigar, which was, you know, I don't know. But uh, yeah, the, and you know, uh, up here where I live in Sussex County now, I've seen a number of the triangular shaped um, uh, UFOs. So yeah, they're around, and lots of people have seen them. And if more people talked about them, maybe we'd get some response from our government. Well, we would like some answers, and uh, there are people uh, working very hard for disclosure, and uh, maybe we'll have somebody on about disclosure soon. But, June, I I just want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us, and, um, you know, keep your eyes on the skies, and uh, perhaps you'll have another experience, (laughs) and we'll have you back on. Uh, But seriously... Thank you so much uh, for joining us on Shattered Reality. But we're going to go now, so bye for now. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, so that's basically it for us here today at Shattered Reality. Um, Hopefully next uh, time we come back to you, uh, Ms. Kate Valentine will be with us. Uh, We just finished number uh, 56. Uh, if, uh, if things all work according to plan, our next guest is going to be the very, very well-known, um, ufologist, a person who's written a book on ufology and has now written another book about his experiences with shamanism and other interesting areas. And that would be Dr. John B. Alexander, who is also a retired uh, colonel. So we're going to welcome him in a couple of weeks to Shattered Reality, if all things go well. And so for now, I'm going to say goodbye from Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality.